Welcome to Real Crime Documentaries. Today we will be looking at serial killer Ted Bundy. My name is Ted Bundy. Theodore Robert Bundy, born on November 24, 1946, and died on January 24, 1989, was an American serial killer who, beginning in the 1970s and maybe earlier, abducted, raped, and killed a number of young women and girls. He finally admitted to 30 killings carried out in seven states between 1974 and 1978, after more than a decade of denials. His actual victim count is unknown but almost certainly far higher. Bundy was frequently praised for his charisma and good looks, qualities he used to gain the trust of both his victims and society at large. He typically approached women in public settings, either by posing as an authority figure, or seeming like he was physically unable to aid them. They would be deceived into agreeing to be escorted away, then beaten unconscious and taken somewhere else to be executed. Bundy repeatedly went back to the bodies of the people he had kidnapped, grooming and having sex with them, until the body's decay and destruction by wild animals prevented any further contact. At least 12 of his victims had their heads removed, and he stored the heads in his apartment as souvenirs. He occasionally broke into people's homes at night and beat them as they slept. As to when or where Bundy started murdering women, there is no agreement. Even when he confessed in vivid detail to scores of later killings in the days leading up to his execution, he refused to reveal the facts of his early crimes and offered various versions to different persons. Nelson was informed by him that although he tried his first kidnapping in Ocean City, New Jersey, he did not actually kill someone until some time in 1971 in Seattle. In 1969, while on a family visit to Philadelphia, he admitted of killing two women in Atlantic City to psychotherapist Art Norman. Bundy intimated to homicide investigator Robert D. Keppel that he had killed a man in Seattle in 1972 and a hitchhiker in a nearby town in 1973, but he would not go into further detail. He might have started murdering as a teenager, according to Rule and Keppel. The first known homicides perpetrated by Bundy occurred in 1974, when he was 27 years old. By then, he had acquired the abilities required in the days before DNA profiling to leave the barest amount of incriminating forensic evidence at crime sites. On January 4, 1974, just after midnight, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks, commonly referred to as Joni Lenz, Mary Adams, and Terry Caldwell, a dancer and student at Owl. This was around the time that he ended his relationship with Edwards. He sexually abused Sparks after beating her with a metal rod or metal speculum from her bed frame, leaving her with severe internal wounds. Despite the fact that she survived and spent 10 days in the hospital unconscious, she was left with physical impairments. On February 1st, early in the morning, Bundy broke into Linda Ann Healy's basement room. Healy was a wonder graduate who provided skiers with morning radio weather reports. Unconscious after beating her, she was then dressed in blue jeans, a white top, and boots while being carried away. Female college students vanished during the first half of 1974, at a rate of roughly one per month. A jazz concert was being held on campus that day, but Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, 60 miles south of Seattle, never showed up. On April 17, Susan Elaine Rancourt, who attended Central Washington State College in Ellensburg, 110 miles south of Seattle, vanished as she was making her way to her dorm room. Later, two female Central Washington students came forward to describe encounters with a man wearing a sling, who was requesting assistance carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. One of these encounters occurred the night of Rancourt's disappearance, and the other occurred three nights earlier. Roberta Kathleen Parks left her Oregon State University dorm in Corvallis, 260 miles south of Seattle, on May 6, in order to meet friends for coffee at the Memorial Union, but she never showed up. Seattle and King County investigators became more worried. The missing women shared little in common with one another outside their comparable appearance as young, pretty, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. There was also little in the way of physical evidence. Brenda Carroll Ball, 22, vanished on June 1 while she was leaving Burian's Flame Tavern, which is close to Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. She was last observed conversing with a brown-haired male who had his arm in a sling in the parking lot. George Ann Hawkins, a University of Washington student, went missing early on June 11 while crossing the street from her sorority home to her boyfriend's dorm. Three Seattle homicide detectives and a criminalist searched the entire alleyway on their hands and knees the following morning without discovering anything. Afterwards, Bundy admitted to Keppel that he had lured Hawkins to his car and used a crowbar to strike her senseless. He handcuffed her, drove her 20 miles east of Seattle to Issaquah, where he strangled her and spent the entire night with her corpse. The following morning, he went back to the Awali and, in the midst of a significant crime scene investigation, found and took Hawkins' earrings and one of her shoes from the nearby parking lot, where he had placed them, and then left unnoticed. 
According to Keppel, it was a daring feat that still astounds police today. Bundy claimed that three times were spent visiting Hawkins' grave. After Hawkins' disappearance was made public, witnesses spoke up to say they saw a man in an alleyway behind a nearby dorm the night she vanished. He was attempting to carry a briefcase while using crutches and a leg cast. According to one woman, the man asked her to assist him in carrying the case to his light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Bundy authored a booklet for women on rape prevention while he was employed at the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee as the assistant director in Olympia during this time. Afterwards, he was employed by the Department of Emergency Services, a state government body charged with the investigation of the disappearances of the women. Carol Ann Boone, a twice-divorced mother of two who would play a significant role in the closing stage of his life six years later, was someone he met and started dating at the day. News of the heinous assault on Sparks and the six missing women was widely reported in newspapers and on television throughout Oregon and Washington. People became more fearful, and the number of young ladies hitchhiking decreased significantly. Law enforcement authorities came under increasing pressure, but they were greatly hamstringed by the lack of tangible proof. Officers refused to give media the scant information they had because they thought it may jeopardize their investigation. Other commonalities amongst the victims included the fact that they always vanished at night, frequently close to active construction sites, and within a week of midterm or final exams. All of the victims were last seen wearing slacks or blue jeans, and numerous crime locations featured sightings of a man driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle while carrying a caster sling. The killings in Oregon and Washington came to a head on July 14, when two women were kidnapped in broad daylight from a busy beach at Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah. Four female witnesses described a handsome young man with a soft accent possibly Canadian or British wearing a white tennis attire and having his left arm in a sling. He identified himself as Ted and asked for assistance in getting a sailboat out of his Tanner Bronze Volkswagen Beetle. Three of them declined, Cindy Sabenbaum, Patricia Ann Turner, and Jacqueline Plischke, one, Janice Graham, followed him to his car, but turned around when she saw there was no yacht there. Three more witnesses saw him approach Janice Ann Ott, 23, a probation caseworker at the King County Juvenile Court, and witnessed her leave the beach in his company. He told her the sailboat narrative. Denise Marie Nasland, a 19-year-old studying to be a computer programmer, left a picnic four hours later to use the restroom and never came back. Bundy admitted to William Hagmayer and Stephen Michaud that Ott was alive when he returned with Nasland and that he had made the other witness the killing of the other under duress, but he later denied it in an interview with Lewis on the day before his execution. After King County Police had a complete description of their suspect and his vehicle, they distributed flyers around the Seattle region. Regional newspapers and local television stations both ran a composite sketch. The profile, the sketch, and the car were all recognized by Klopfer, Rule, a DES employee, and a psychology professor, who suggested Bundy as a potential suspect. However, detectives who were receiving up to 200 tips per day thought it unlikely that a well-groomed law student with no adult criminal record could be the perpetrator. Two miles east of Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah, two grouse hunters discovered Ott and Maslin skeletal remains on September 6. Later, Bundy determined that the extra femur and many vertebrae at the scene were really Hawkins. On Taylor Mountain, where Bundy frequently walked, just east of Issaquah, forestry students from Green River Community College found the skulls and mandibles of Healy, Rancourt, Parks, and Ball six months later. The remains of Manson were never found. Bundy left Klopfer in Seattle after receiving a second admittance to the University of Utah Law School in August 1974. He dated at least a dozen other women while still calling Klopfer frequently. He was dismayed to learn that the other students had something, some intellectual aptitude, that he did not, as he reread the first-year law curriculum. The lectures were utterly beyond his comprehension. It was a huge letdown for him, he admitted. The following month saw the start of a fresh wave of killings, including two that wouldn't be revealed until Bundy admitted to them just before his death. He raped and strangled an unnamed hitchhiker in Idaho on September 2 and either dumped the body right away in a river or came back the next day to take pictures and dismember it. He kidnapped Nancy Wilcox, 16, on October 2 in Holiday, Utah, a Salt Lake City enclave. Around 200 miles south of Holiday, Bundy told authorities that her bones were buried close to Capitol Reef National Park, but they were never discovered. The 17-year-old daughter of the Midvale, a different neighborhood of Salt Lake City, police chief, Melissa Ann Smith, vanished on October 18 after leaving a pizzeria. Nine days after she vanished, her naked body was discovered in a neighboring mountainous area. A post-mortem test revealed that she may have survived for up to seven days after that. 135-136 A 17-year-old girl named Laura Ann Aim vanished on October 31st in Lehigh, Utah, 25 miles to the south, after leaving a cafe shortly after midnight. 
On Thanksgiving Day, hikers in American Fork Canyon, nine miles to the northeast, discovered her naked body. Both girls had suffered from beatings, rapes, sodomizations, and nylon stocking strangulations. Years later, Bundy spoke of the postmortem procedures he performed on the bodies of Smith and Ain, including shampooing their hair and applying cosmetics. In the late afternoon of November 8, less than a mile from the Midvale restaurant where Smith was last seen, Bundy got in touch with 18-year-old phone operator Carol Derinch at Fashion Place Mall in Murray. Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department introduced himself and informed Derinch that someone had attempted to break into her car. To make a complaint at the station, he requested her to go with him. Bundy quickly pulled over into the shoulder and made an attempt to handcuff her after Derinch pointed out that he was traveling on a road that didn't lead to the police station. He unintentionally secured both handcuffs on the same wrist during their struggle, allowing Derinch to unlock the car door and flee. Deborah Jean Kent, a 17-year-old student at Beaumont High School in Bountiful, which is 20 miles north of Murray, vanished later that evening after leaving the school's theater show to pick up her brother. Police were informed by the theater instructor at the school and a student that a stranger had requested them all to come out to the parking lot to identify an automobile. The same man was later noticed pacing at the back of the auditorium by a different student, and a drama teacher eventually caught him again just before the play ended. Investigators discovered a key outside the theater that allowed them to release Derringe from his restraints. In November, Cloakfer made a second call to King County Police after learning that young women were going missing in areas around Salt Lake City. She was thoroughly questioned by serious crime section detective Randy Hergesheimer. In the King County hierarchy of suspicion by then, Bundy had significantly increased, but the Lake Sammamish witness believed to be most dependable by detectives didn't recognize him from an image lineup. Cloakfer confirmed her suspicions over the phone to the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office in December. Although Bundy's name was added to their list of suspects, there was no reliable forensic evidence connecting him to the crimes in Utah at the time. After finishing his final examinations, Bundy traveled back to Seattle in January 1975, where he spent a week with Cloakfer, who kept a secret from him that she had reported him to the police three times. She planned a trip to Salt Lake City in August to see him. Bundy moved a large portion of his criminal enterprise from his Utah headquarters to Colorado in 1975. 400 miles south of Salt Lake City, in Snowmass Village, at the Wildwood Inn, now the Wildwood Lodge, a registered nurse named Karen Eileen Campbell, 23, vanished as she was making her way down a well-lit hallway to her room on January 12. A month later, her naked body was discovered next to a dirt road not far from the resort. Her body also showed significant cuts from a sharp weapon. She had been slain by blows to the head from a blunt instrument that left recognizable linear groove depressions on her skull. Julie Cunningham, a 26-year-old ski instructor from Vail, vanished on March 15 as she was on her way from her apartment to a dinner meeting with a friend, 100 miles northeast of Snowmass. Afterwards, Bundy admitted to Colorado police that he approached Cunningham on crutches, asked her to assist him take his ski boots to his car, clubbed her, chained her, and then strangled her at a second location close to Rifle, 90 miles west of Vail. He traveled from Salt Lake City to see her remains six hours later, after a few weeks had passed. On April 6, while cycling to her parents' house in Grand Junction, Colorado, Denise Lynn Oliverson, 25, vanished. Her bicycle and sandals were later discovered beneath a viaduct close to a railroad overpass. Lynette Dawn Culver, 12, was enticed by Bundy from Alameda Junior High School in Pocatello, Idaho, 160 miles north of Salt Lake City, on May 6. He murdered her by drowning her in his hotel room before dumping her remains in a river, perhaps the Snake River, north of Pocatello. Three of Bundy's co-workers from the Washington State Des, including Boone, visited him in Salt Lake City in the middle of May and stayed for a week in his apartment. He then spent a week in Seattle with Cloakfer in the beginning of June when they talked about being married the Christmas after that. Likewise, Cloakfer made no mention of her several conversations with Salt Lake County and King County officials. Neither Bundy's prolonged connection with Boone nor his contemporaneous involvement with a Utah law student described variously as Kim Andrews or Sharon Hour were publicized. Susan Curtis disappeared on June 28 from the Brigham Young University campus in Provo, Utah, which is located 45 miles south of Salt Lake City. Bundy's final confession which was taped just before he entered the execution chamber contained details of her murder. It was never possible to find the remains of Wilcox Kent, Cunningham, Oliverson, Culver, and Curtis. Bundy was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in August or September 1975, although he did not actively participate in church activities and disregarded the majority of church rules. Once he was found guilty of kidnapping in 1976, the LDS Church would subsequently excommunicate him. When questioned about his preferred religion following his incarceration, Bundy replied, Methodist, citing his upbringing. 
Investigations into the murder spree in the Pacific Northwest that stopped as abruptly as it had begun were still ongoing in Washington state. They turned to the then innovative tactic of creating a database in an effort to make sense of an overwhelming amount of data. As the only one accessible, they employed the King County Peril Computer, a big primitive machine by modern standards. They searched the computer for coincidences after entering the several lists they had assembled, including classmates and associates of each victim, Volkswagen owners named Ted, known sex offenders, and more. Out of thousands of names, 26 appeared on four lists, with Ted Bundy being one of them. Bundy was also included on the detective's personally generated list of their 100 greatest suspects. When word of his arrest arrived from Utah, he was literally at the top of the pile of suspects. Officer Bob Hayward of the Utah Highway Patrol detained Bundy on August 16, 1975, in Granger, another suburb of Salt Lake City. In the early morning hours, Hayward saw Bundy driving through a neighborhood in his Volkswagen Beetle before spotting the patrol cruiser and escaping quickly. He looked around the VW and saw that the front passenger seat had been taken out and put on the back seats. He discovered other items that at first glance appeared to be burglary tools, including a ski mask, a second mask made out of pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, a coil of rope, and an ice pick. The handcuffs were something he had discovered in a dumpster, according to Bundy, and the other items were standard home stuff. The ski mask was for skiing. But, Detective Jerry Thompson remembered Bundy's name from Klopfer's phone call a month later, and a similar suspect and automobile description from the November 1974 Derringe kidnapping. Police discovered a flyer for the Viewmont High School play in Bountiful, where Kent vanished, and a map to Colorado ski resorts with a checkmark beside the Wildwood Inn when searching Bundy's apartment. Bundy was released on his own recognizance because the police lacked sufficient evidence to hold him. Nevertheless, Bundy claimed that a concealed cache of Polaroid pictures of his victims which he later destroyed after being freed had eluded the searches. The Salt Lake City Police put Bundy under constant observation, and Thompson and two other detectives took a flight to Seattle to speak with Klopfer. She claimed that in the year before Bundy moved to Utah, she had found items in both Bundy's apartment and her home that she couldn't explain. Crutches, a bag of plaster of Paris that he admitted stealing from the pharmacy, and a meat cleaver that was never used for cutting meat, were among these things. A bag full of women's clothing, a pair of surgical gloves, and an Asian knife in a wooden case that he kept in his glove box were other items. Since Bundy was always in debt, Klopfer believed that practically everything of value that Bundy owned had been stolen. When she challenged him about a new TV and stereo, he threatened to break her neck if she told anyone. She claimed Bundy grew extremely agitated if she even considered cutting her long, middle-parted hair. Sometimes, when she woke up in the middle of the night, he was looking at her body with a flashlight under the blankets. He frequently took her Volkswagen Beetle, which he kept in the trunk for safety, and taped a lug wrench halfway up the handle. The investigators determined that neither the day Odd and Naslin were kidnapped from Lake Sammamish State Park, nor any of the evenings that the victims from the Pacific Northwest had gone missing, Bundy had not been there with Klopfer. When Seattle homicide detective Kathy McChesney spoke with Klopfer shortly after, she discovered about Diane Edwards' existence and her brief engagement to Bundy around Christmas 1973. Bundy sold his Volkswagen Beetle to a Midvale teenager in September. It was seized by Utah police, and FBI specialists disassembled and searched it. Hairs were discovered that matched those taken from Campbell's body. Eventually, they discovered hair fragments that were microscopically indistinguishable from Smith's and Derringe's. The discovery of hair strands matching three distinct victims who had never met one another in a single car, according to FBI lab specialist Robert Neal, would be a coincidence of mind-boggling rarity. On October 2, investigators lined up Bundy. Witnesses from Bountiful identified him as the foreigner in the Viewmont High School auditorium, and Derringe recognized him right away as Officer Roseland. In the Derringe case, there was more than enough evidence to accuse him of aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault, but not enough to connect him to Kent, whose body was never discovered. He was granted freedom on a $15,000 bail, which was covered by his parents. He resided in Klopfer's home in Seattle for the majority of the time between his arrest and trial. Police in Seattle kept him under close observation, despite not having enough evidence to charge him in the deaths that occurred in the Pacific Northwest. According to Klopfer, so many unmarked police cars began up that it sounded like the start of the Indy 500 when Ted and I stepped out onto the porch to go somewhere. In November, 30 detectives and prosecutors from five states convened in Aspen, Colorado, where the three main Bundy investigators Jerry Thompson from Utah, Robert Keppel from Washington, and Michael Fisher from Colorado exchanged information. Officials concluded that more concrete evidence would be required before Bundy could be prosecuted with any of the murders, even though they left the meeting, later known as the Aspen Summit, sure that he was the murderer they were looking for. Bundy was put on trial for the kidnapping of Derringe in February 1976. 
he forfeited his right to a jury on the recommendation of his lawyer, John O'Connell, because of the controversy surrounding the case. He was convicted guilty of kidnapping and assault by Judge Stuart Hansen Jr., following a four-day bench trial and a weekend of deliberation. He was given a prison term of 1 to 15 years at Utah State Prison in June. He was placed in solitary confinement for many weeks after being discovered hidden in the bushes in the prison yard, carrying a escape package that included a social security card, road atlases, and airline itineraries. Colorado authorities accused him of killing Campbell later that month. He first resisted extradition, but in January 1977 he waived the process and was sent to Aspen. During a preliminary hearing, Bundy was driven 40 miles on June 7, 1977, from the Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs to the Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen. The judge released him from having to wear handcuffs or leg shackles, since he had chosen to act as his own attorney. He requested to use the courthouse's law library during a break to conduct research for his case. He opened a window and fell to the earth from the second story, while hidden from his guard's eyes behind a bookcase, breaking his right ankle on impact. As barricades were being set up on Aspen's outskirts, Bundy discarded his outer layer of clothing and limped through the town. He then went southward to Aspen Peak. He broke into a hunting cabin close to the peak and took food, clothes, and a rifle. He left the chalet the next day and headed south towards Crested Butte, but became lost in the forest. He missed two routes that headed down the mountain to his targeted location during his two days of aimless wandering. On June 10, he broke into a camper on Maroon Lake, 10 miles south of Aspen, and stole food and a ski parka. Rather than going south, he turned around and walked back towards Aspen, dodging search teams and barricades en route. He stole a car at the Aspen Golf Course's edge three days later. Bundy returned to Aspen while suffering from the cold, lack of sleep, and persistent discomfort from his sprained ankle. Two policemen stopped him after noticing his car swerving in and out of their lanes. He'd been on the run for six days. Maps of the mountains near Aspen that the prosecution was using to show where Campbell's body was found were in the car, showing that Bundy's escape had been planned, as his own attorney, he was entitled to rights of discovery. Bundy disregarded the counsel of friends and attorneys to remain in place and return to Glenwood Springs Jail. The prosecution's case, which was already at best tenuous, was progressively losing strength, as important pieces of evidence were routinely ruled inadmissible, and pretrial motions were consistently decided in his favor. A more sensible defendant could have understood that his chances of being found not guilty were good, and that successfully defending against the murder accusation in Colorado would likely have discouraged other prosecutors. If Ted had persisted, he might have been released from his derringe conviction with as little as a year and a half remaining. Bundy instead put together a fresh escape strategy. He obtained a hacksaw blade and a full floor plan of the Garfield County Jail from other prisoners. He also gathered $500 in cash, which he later said was brought in illegally over a six-month period by guests, including Boone. He sawed a hole in his cell's ceiling of about one square foot between the steel-reinforcing bars in the nights when other convicts had showers. He was able to crawl through and investigate the crawl space above after losing 35 pounds, which enabled him to perform several practice runs in the weeks that followed. Numerous claims of movement in the ceiling made by an informant during the night were not looked into. By the end of 1977, Bundy's upcoming trial had gained national attention in the sleepy hamlet of Aspen, and he moved for the trial to be held in Denver. The motion was granted on December 23 by the Aspen trial judge, but Colorado Springs was chosen because its jurors had a reputation for being unfriendly to murder suspects. On the evening of December 30, with a majority of the jail staff away for the holiday and nonviolent inmates enjoying time off with their families, Bundy made his bed out of books and folders, covered it with a blanket to resemble his sleeping body, and crept into the crawl space. He entered the chief jailer's apartment through the roof while he and his wife were out for the evening, changed into street clothes from the jailer's wardrobe, and then escaped through the front door. After taking a car, Bundy left Glenwood Springs heading east, but the vehicle soon broke down on Interstate 70 in the Rockies. He was given a ride into Vail, 60 miles to the east, by a passing driver. He took a bus from there to Denver, where he booked an early morning flight to Chicago. The jail's skeleton staff in Glenwood Springs did not learn about the escape until midday on December 31st more than 17 hours later. Bundy was already in Chicago at that point. Bundy took a train from Chicago to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where he was present on January 2nd in a neighborhood bar. He stole a car and traveled to Atlanta, Georgia, five days later. From there, he took a bus and landed in Tallahassee, Florida, early on January 8. He spent one night in a hotel before renting a room at a boarding house close to Florida State University, using the identity Chris Hagen. Later, Bundy claimed that his initial intent was to find gainful employment and stop engaging in criminal activity because he believed he could continue to live freely and unnoticed in Florida for as long as he avoided drawing the attention of the police. 
However, his one and only job application at a construction site had to be abandoned when he was required to show identification. He resumed his previous behaviors of shoplifting and robbing cash and credit cards from women's wallets, left in abandoned shopping carts at neighborhood supermarkets. One week after arriving in Tallahassee, Bundy entered the Kaya Mega Sorority home at Florida State University through a back door that had a broken locking mechanism in the early hours of January 15, 1978. He hit Margaret Bowman, 21, with a hefty piece of oak firewood beginning at around 2.45 a.m., shattering her skull. Next, after ripping her panties off violently enough to cause friction burns on one of her thighs, he garroted her with a nylon stocking. After killing Bowman, he crossed the hall and went straight into the bedroom of Lisa Levy, 20, where he beat her until she was unconscious and strangled her. Bundy bit into Levy's left buttock and threw one of her nipples, almost severing it from her right breast, in what would later be considered one of the most important pieces of evidence against him at his trial. He raped her vaginally and anally in a brutal attack that tore her internal organs, using a bottle of hair mist that Levy had in her room. He attacked Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler in an adjacent bedroom, fracturing Kathy Kleiner's jaw and severely lacerated her shoulder. Karen Chandler also sustained a concussion, a broken jaw, tooth loss, and a crushed finger. Kleiner claimed that the reason Chandler and Kleiner were able to escape the attack was because car headlights illuminated the inside of their room and scared the assailant away. Nita Neary, a sorority sister, entered via the back door as Bundy fled the scene and caught him in the act. Detectives in Tallahassee discovered that the four assaults occurred in a span of less than 15 minutes, in close proximity to more than 30 witnesses who were oblivious to anything. Not long after Bundy's rampage, police gathered at the sorority house and started looking into the situation. Initially, people mistook Levy's bite mark for a gunshot wound and thought there had been a shooting at the sorority home due to the puncture wound through her nipple. Levy initially survived the attack despite being critically hurt and unconscious, however he passed away shortly after while being transported to the hospital. Bundy traveled to a duplex eight blocks away within the hour, put on a handmade pantyhose mask with holes cut out for him to look through, and then approached the apartment's basement window and went through it while it was dark. Around 4 a.m., Bundy saw FSU student Cheryl Thomas asleep in her bed and attacked her savagely, dislocating her shoulder and breaking her jaw and skull five times. Her dance career was ended by irreversible hearing loss and harm to her equilibrium. For some reason, Bundy took off his mask and threw it on the mattress. Thomas's neighbors in the nearby rooms heard the commotion and called the police, who arrived to find her laying in bed severely battered. The authorities discovered a semen stain on the bed, in addition to the mask he had left behind, which included hairs similar to Bundy's in class and characteristic. But, there was no proof of a sexual assault. Law enforcement was baffled by the timing of Bundy's attack on Thomas, with Sheriff Ken Katsuris originally expressing shock and skepticism that the same person would strike again in such a short period of time. On February 8, Bundy took an FSU van that had been stolen 150 miles east to Jacksonville. Leslie Parmenter, 14, the daughter of the Jacksonville Police Department's chief of detectives, was in a parking lot when he approached her. He introduced himself as Richard Burton, fire department, but withdrew when Parmenter's older brother confronted him. He traveled 60 miles westward to Lake City that afternoon. The next day at Lake City Junior High School, 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach was asked by a teacher to go to her homeroom to get a lost pocketbook, she never came back to class. Her partially mummified bones were discovered seven weeks later, 35 miles northwest of Lake City, in a pig farrowing shed close to Suwinee River State Park, following a thorough search. Experts in forensics believed that Leach had been sexually assaulted before having her throat slashed. On February 12, Bundy stole a car and left Tallahassee, traveling through the Florida Panhandle, as he ran out of money to pay his past due rent and grew increasingly concerned that the authorities were pursuing him. He was apprehended by Pensacola police officer David Lee three days later at around 1 a.m., after a wants and warrants check, revealed his Volkswagen Beetle had been stolen. Bundy kicked Lee's legs out from under him and fled after learning he was being arrested. Lee chased after him and tackled him after firing two warning bullets. Before the officer managed to overpower and arrest Bundy, the two engaged in a battle for Lee's gun. Three sets of female FSU student IDs, 21 stolen credit cards, and a stolen television were all found in the stolen car. The disguise used by Richard Burton, fire department in Jacksonville, was later determined to be a pair of plaid slacks and a pair of dark-rimmed non-prescription glasses that were also discovered. Unaware that he had just apprehended one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives, Lee was transporting his suspect to jail when he overheard Bundy saying, I wish you had murdered me. In June 1979, Bundy was put on trial for the Kaya Mega murders and assaults after the trial's location was changed to Miami. The trial was the first to be broadcast nationwide on American television and was covered by 250 reporters from five different countries. 
Although there were five court-appointed counsel present, Bundy once more handled the majority of his own defense. He sabotaged the entire defense effort from the beginning out of spite, distrust, and grandiose delusion, Nelson later remarked. Ted was accused of murder and could receive the death penalty, but all that mattered to him, it seemed, was being in command. A pre-trial plea agreement was reached, according to Mike Minerva, a Tallahassee public defender and member of the defense team, in which Bundy would admit to killing Levy, Bowman, and Leach, in exchange for a set sentence of 75 years in prison. According to one report, prosecutors were open to a compromise, since they had a very strong chance of losing a trial. Bundy, on the other hand, considered the plea agreement as a tactical maneuver that would allow him to submit his plea and then wait a few years for witnesses to pass away, move on, or recant their testimony, as well as for evidence to break down or go missing. He may pursue a post-conviction request to throw aside the plea and get an acquittal once the prosecution's case against him had deteriorated beyond repair. But at the last minute, Bundy rejected the offer. He came to the realization that he would have to confess his crime in front of everyone, Minerva added. He just wasn't able to accomplish it. Bundy began a series of interviews with Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth soon after the Leach trial ended and the protracted appeals process got underway. He started disclosing information about his crimes and mental processes for the first time, primarily speaking in the third person to avoid the stigma of confession. As Bundy described his career as a thief, Klopfer's long-held hunch that he had stolen almost everything of value from him was confirmed. The biggest reward for me, he continued, was actually having what I had stolen. I thoroughly liked possessing something that I had sought after and gotten. Possession turned out to be a significant factor in both rape and murder cases. He claimed that sexual assault satisfied his desire to completely possess his victims. He initially murdered his victims as a matter of convenience to eliminate the prospect of being caught, however, later on, murder became a part of the adventure. The taking of a life, he claimed, was the ultimate possession. The actual possession of the remains follows. Bundy also shared information with FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit Special Agent William Hagmayer. Hagmayer was astounded by Bundy's deep even supernatural delight from killing. Hagmayer recalled, he explained that after a while, murder is not only a crime of lust or violence. It takes possession of it. The places where you kill them or leave them become precious to you, and you will always be pulled back to them. They are part of you. The victim becomes a part of you. You two are forever one. Hagmayer was informed by Bundy that he initially saw himself as an impulsive and amateur killer, before transitioning into what he called his prime or predator phase around the time of Healy's murder in 1974. Notwithstanding the fact that he never officially acknowledged killing, this meant that he started doing it well before 1974. Two hacksaw blades were concealed in Bundy's cell when prison authorities searched it in July 1984. One of the cell's windows had a steel bar that had been entirely sawed through a top and bottom and put back in with a homemade soap-based glue. When guards discovered an illicit mirror a few months later, Bundy was sent to a new cell. Shortly after, he was accused of a disciplinary offense for having unapproved correspondence with John Hinckley Jr., a notorious felon. In an attempt to aid with the continuing search in Washington for the Green River Killer, subsequently identified as Gary Ridgway, Bundy got in touch with Keppel in October 1984 and offered to impart his alleged knowledge of serial killer psychology. Bundy was interviewed by Keppel and Green River Task Force Detective Dave Reichard, but Ridgway evaded capture for an additional 17 years. After working with Mitch O on another analysis of the interview materials, Keppel produced a thorough description of the Green River interviews. The Chi Omega convictions were scheduled for death on March 4, 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court provided a brief stay, but the execution was swiftly rescheduled. The full extent of Bundy's crimes, including what he did to some of his victims after they died, were ultimately revealed to Hagmayer and Nelson in April, just after the new date, July 2, was announced. He said that he frequently returned to the secondary murder scenes of Taylor Mountain, Issaquah, and other locations to lie with his victims and engage in sex activities with their bodies before putrefaction forced him to stop. In some instances, he spent the entire night while driving several hours each way. In Utah, he constantly washed Ames' hair and put cosmetics on Smith's dead face. He said to Hagmare, if you've got time, they can be anything you want them to be. He used a hacksaw to cut off the skulls of perhaps 12 of his victims, and at least one group of the severed heads likely the four later discovered on Taylor Mountain, Rancourt, Parks, Bowl, and Healy was kept in his apartment before being disposed of. Less than 15 hours before the scheduled July 2 execution, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals stated indefinitely and remanded the Chi Omega case for review on a number of technicalities including Bundy's capacity to stand trial and an incorrect instruction by the trial judge during the penalty phase, requiring the jury to decide between life in prison and the death penalty that, in the end, were never resolved. 
The leech sentence was then scheduled to be executed on November 18th. On November 17th, the 11th Circuit Court issued a stay. Despite the dissents of Justices Thurgood Marshall and William J. Brennan Jr., the Supreme Court declined to revisit the 11th Circuit's decision against Bundy in December 1988. After that last refusal, a firm execution date of January 24, 1989, was declared shortly after. For a case involving capital murder, Bundy's progress through the appellate courts had been extraordinarily quick. Contrary to common assumption, Bundy was hurried through the legal system as quickly as possible. Even the prosecutors admitted that Bundy's attorneys never used delay strategies. Although though Ted Bundy's execution appeared to be taking longer than expected, Ted Bundy was actually close to being executed. After exhausting all appeals, Bundy decided to be open and honest with the authorities because he had no reason to continue to try to cover up his crimes. He admitted to Keppel that he was responsible for all eight of the murders in Oregon and Washington, for which he was the main suspect. He described two more fatalities in Oregon and two more in Washington who were previously unknown, if indeed he ever knew their identities. Manson's body was the sixth, he claimed, but her head was burned in Cloakford's fireplace. Eppel remarked, he detailed the Issaquah murder scene, and it was almost as if he had just been there. Ott, Nasland, and Hawkins' bones were discovered there. As if he could see everything. Having spent so much time there, he was enamored with the idea. Simply said, he is always completely preoccupied with murder. Nelson had similar thoughts. The blatant misogyny of his actions, as well as his obvious rage against women, astounded her, she noted. He had no empathy at all since he was so preoccupied with the facts. His life's work consisted of killings. Bundy admitted to committing multiple further homicides, including several that the police were unaware of, to detectives from Idaho, Utah, and Colorado. He explained that he could bring his victims back to his apartment in Utah so that he could reenact scenes from detective magazine covers. It didn't take long for a new ulterior plan to become clear. By withholding key information, he hoped to secure yet another stay of execution. He acknowledged, there are more buried bones in Colorado, but he made no further comment. The new plan, which was quickly called Ted's Bones for Time Plot, did little to provide fresh specific information and instead served to strengthen the authorities' desire to see Bundy killed on schedule. When he provided specifics, nothing was discovered. This was seen by Colorado investigator Matt Linville as a contradiction between the killer's wish to maintain complete possession the only person who knew his victim's exact resting places and his desire to delay his execution by disclosing information. Bundy supporters started pushing for the only available option, executive clemency, after it became evident that no additional stays would be granted by the courts. In order to allow Bundy time to provide further details, Diana Weiner, a young Florida lawyer and Bundy's final rumored love interest, requested that the relatives of many Colorado and Utah victims petition Florida Governor Bob Martinez for a postponement. Everyone objected. According to Nelson, the families already thought the victims were dead and that Ted had killed them. They were not in need of his admission. Martinez made it clear that he would not consent to any additional delays. He told reporters, we are not going to allow the system to be corrupted. It's terrible that he would bargain for his life over the bodies of victims. Boone defended Bundy's innocence during each of his trials and felt very betrayed by his admission of guilt. On the morning of his execution, she returned to Washington with her daughter but declined to take his call. She was harmed by his friendship with Diana Weiner and she was devastated by his unexpected sweeping disclosures in his final days, according to Nelson. At Bundy's final discussions with detectives, Hagmeyer was there. He spoke of suicide on the night before his execution. According to Hagmeyer, he did not want to give the state the gratification of witnessing him die. On January 24, 1989, at 7.16 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Bundy was put to death in the Ryford electric chair. His final words were, Jim and Fred, I'd like you to offer my love to my family and friends, spoken to his lawyer Jim Coleman and Methodist pastor Fred Lawrence. As Bundy was put to death, hundreds of celebrators gathered in a pasture across from the prison to sing, dance, and light fireworks. They then cheered as the white hearse carrying Bundy's body left the facility. In accordance with his wishes, he was cremated in Gainesville, and his ashes were dispersed to an unidentified place in the Cascade Range of Washington State. Bundy was a very well-prepared and cunning criminal who exploited his in-depth understanding of law enforcement tactics to avoid detection and capture for years. His crime scenes were spread out across a wide area, and before it became evident that multiple investigators in various jurisdictions were pursuing the same suspect, his victim count had reached at least 20. The two relatively quiet assault methods Bundy preferred were blunt trauma and strangling, both of which could be carried out using everyday objects. He purposely stayed away from guns because of the noise they made and the ballistics they left behind. 
He was a meticulous researcher who meticulously investigated his surroundings in quest of secure locations to seize and dispose of victims. He had a remarkable talent for discrediting tangible evidence. He frequently insisted during the years he tried to prove his innocence that neither his fingerprints nor any other unmistakable proof of his guilt was ever discovered at a murder scene. The fact that Bundy had essentially nameless physical characteristics and an odd chameleon-like capacity to modify his look nearly at will presented law enforcement with additional significant challenges. Early on, authorities protested that it was pointless to offer witnesses his photo because he appeared differently in almost every photograph ever taken of him. In person, the judge in the Derinch trial, Stuart Hansen Jr., observed that his expression would so shift his whole appearance that there were occasions when you weren't even sure you were looking at the same guy. He truly was a changeling, Bundy was well aware of this peculiar feature, and he took use of it by subtly altering his facial hair or haircut to dramatically change his image as needed. Using turtleneck shirts and sweaters, he covered his one prominent identifying feature, a dark mole on his neck. Even his Volkswagen Beetle was a challenge to identify, witnesses gave varying accounts of its color, including metallic or non-metallic, tan or bronze, light brown or dark brown. According to FBI specialists, Bundy's method of operation developed over time and became more organized and sophisticated, as is characteristic of serial killers. Early on, it involved a violent attack with a blunt object on a sleeping victim after a late-night forcible entry. His selection of victims in crime scenes got more methodical as his methods developed. He would use a variety of tricks to draw his target close to his truck, where he had a weapon typically a Kroger pre-positioned. He frequently hobbled on crutches, had one leg or arm in a plaster cast, or was wearing a sling, and then asked for help carrying anything to his car. Bundy was thought to be attractive and charismatic, qualities he used to gain the trust of both his victims and others around him in daily life. According to Mitchell, Ted enticed girls the way a lifeless oak flower may deceive a honeybee. He used authority by posing as a police officer or firefighter when his good looks and charm were ineffective. Bundy would beat and pound them until he had them close to or inside his car, at which point he would cuff them. Then, after bringing them to a secondary location of his choosing often one that was quite far away he would rape them before strangling them with a gerd. The secondary location in the case of his victims in Utah would be his apartment complex. He reverted to targeting sleeping victims randomly towards the end of his rampage in Florida, maybe under the strain of being a wanted man. At secondary locations, Bundy would take the victim's clothing and burn it afterwards, or in at least one instance, Cunningham's, he would place the victim's clothing in a Goodwill Industries collection bin. He clarified that the clothes removal was ritualistic but also practical, because it reduced the possibility of leaving behind any traces of evidence at the crime scene that would lead to his identification. Ironically, a major incriminating link to the Leach murder was provided by a manufacturing fault in fibers from his own garment. He frequently returned to his secondary crime scenes to perform necrophilic behaviors and to groom or present the corpses. Other victims were discovered dressed in outfits they had never worn before with nail varnish that their relatives had never seen. Many of Bundy's victims were captured on Polaroid photographs. He told Hagmayer, you don't want to forget it when you work hard to achieve something well. He explained to Keppel and Macho that drinking a lot of alcohol was an essential component of his strategy, he needed to be extremely drunk when out hunting in order to significantly diminish his inhibitions and sedate the dominant personality he was afraid might stop his inner entity from acting on its impulses. All of Bundy's documented victims were white women, the majority of whom came from middle-class families. Most of them were college students, and the majority of them were between the ages of 15 and 25. It appears that he has never made contact with anyone he may have met before. Bundy said to Cloakford that he had purposefully avoided her, as he felt the power of his sickness swelling in him during their final chat before his death. Rule observed that the majority of the victims had long, straight hair that was parted in the center, just like Diane Edwards, the woman he subsequently became engaged to before she also rejected him. Rule hypothesized that Bundy's long-lasting spree was sparked by his hatred for his first lover, which led him to select victims who resembled her. They simply matched the broad requirements of being young and pretty, Bundy informed Ainsworth, dismissing this claim. Too many people have believed this nonsense that all the girls were alike, although practically everything about them was different physically. He did admit that while choosing his victims, youth and beauty were extremely crucial criterion. Rule was shocked and dismayed to learn that many sensitive, educated, nice young women had written their call to express their profound sadness over Bundy's death. Numerous people had written to him, each thinking that she was his only one, according to one of them. Many claimed that after his passing, they experienced nervous breakdowns. Rule stated that Ted hurt women even in death. They must acknowledge that they were duped by the master con artist in order to recover. They are lamenting the loss of an imaginary shadow figure. Bundy underwent a number of mental tests, and the results were inconsistent. 
bipolar disorder was initially diagnosed by Dorothy Otno Lewis, a professor of psychiatry at the New York University School of Medicine and an expert on aggressive conduct, however, she later revised her opinion several times. Based on behaviors described in interviews and testimony from the court, she also suggested that Bundy might have multiple personality disorder. A great aunt saw an incident in which Bundy displayed one of these traits. She suddenly, mysteriously discovered herself afraid of her favorite nephew as they waited together at a dusk-darkened train station. She appeared to change into another unrecognizable person. He was now an unfamiliar person. Lewis cited a Tallahassee jail employee who described a comparable transformation. He turned weird on me, he claimed. He had a metamorphosis, changing his body and face, and he noticed a faint odor coming from him. He claimed, that was the day I was terrified of him, adding, almost a total change of demeanor. The majority of the evidence led away from bipolar disorder or other psychoses and towards antisocial personality disorder, even though specialists considered Bundy's exact diagnosis tricky, ASPD. Bundy exhibited a number of personality traits typical of ASPD patients, who are frequently referred to as sociopaths or psychopaths, including an air of charisma and charm that belied a lack of true character or genuine insight, the capacity to distinguish right from wrong with little effect on behavior, and a lack of regret or guilt. In 1981, Bundy remarked that guilt actually doesn't solve anything. It causes you pain. I suppose that I am fortunate to not have to deal with guilt. Also, there was proof of narcissism, bad judgment, and deceptive behavior. Bundy reportedly scored a 39 40th on the Psychopathy Checklist Revised PCLR, after being assessed. According to prosecutor George Deacon, sociopaths are arrogant manipulators who believe they can deceive anyone. One doctor stated, he manipulates even me sometimes. Lewis eventually sided with the majority, telling Nelson, I often tell my graduate students that if they can find me a real, authentic psychopath, I'll buy them dinner. I never believed they existed, but I believe Ted may have been one, a pure psychopath who lacked any sense of regret or empathy. In at least one subsequent retrospective investigation, narcissistic personality disorder has been suggested as a possible alternative diagnosis. The day before his execution, Bundy spoke with James Dobson, a psychologist and the man who founded the Christian evangelical group Focus for the Family. He took use of the occasion to make further assertions about media violence and the pornographic roots of his actions. It happened gradually in phases, he added. In my experience, once you become addicted to pornography that deals with sexuality violently, you will keep hunting for more intense, explicit, and graphic content. The pornography can only take you so far before you start to wonder if actually engaging in it would have benefits beyond merely reading or viewing it. He claimed that violence in the media, especially sexualized violence, led youths along the road to become Ted Bundy's. He suggested that the FBI should keep watch over adult movie theaters and follow customers as they leave. He declared, you're going to murder me, and that will shield society from me. Yet, there are a great deal more individuals outside who are addicted to porn, and you are doing nothing to stop it. Well, most biographers, scholars, and other observers have concluded that Bundy's sudden denunciation of pornography was one last devious attempt to shift blame by appealing to Dobson's agenda as a long-standing pornography critic, Nelson seems to have been convinced that Bundy's concern was real. He disclosed to Dobson, in a 1977 letter to Rule, he questioned, who in the world reads these publications? True crime detective magazines had corrupted him and fueled his fantasies to the point of becoming a serial killer. I've only ever picked one up on two or three occasions, and I've never bought one of these magazines. He said as much to Hagmayer the night before he spoke to Dobson, as well as Mitch Owen Ainsworth in 1980. Pornography didn't play a significant part in his development as a serial killer, he said. Deacle stated, pornography wasn't the issue. The issue was with Bundy. Rule wrote, I wish I could believe that his motivations were benevolent. But, all I can make out on the Dobson tape is just another mind trick by Ted Bundy. The tape has the effect of once more placing the blame for his crimes not on him, but on us. Rule and Ainsworth both observed that Bundy always attributed the blame to someone or something else. Even though he was given the chance to do so before the Chi Omega trial, which could have spared him the death penalty, he never acknowledged responsibility for any of the 30 murders he later confessed to. He shifted responsibility to a wide range of scapegoats, including his violent grandfather, the fact that his biological father was absent, the fact that his mother had concealed his true parentage, alcohol, the media, the police, whom he accused of fabricating evidence, society in general, violence on television, and, in the end, true crime publications and pornography. He claimed that television shows brainwashed him into stealing credit cards, since he primarily watched them on sets that he had stolen. At least once, he even made an attempt to place the blame on his victims. In a 1977 letter to Klopfer, he said, I have known people who radiate weakness. They are expressing fear with their faces. 
These individuals encourage abuse do they subconsciously encourage being wounded by anticipating it to happen. He protested to Lewis, I don't know why everyone is out to get me. He genuinely had no understanding of the gravity of what he had done, according to her. Keppel noted that a persistent serial killer erects enormous walls of denial to his guilt, walls of denial that might sometimes never be penetrated. Nelson concurred. He had to leap a tall barrier he had created inside himself long ago, she wrote, each time he was obliged to make a genuine confession. Bundy admitted to 30 murders the night before he was put to death, but the actual number is unknown. Reported estimates have ranged up to 100 or more, and Bundy occasionally left cryptic remarks to fuel this rumor. In 1980, he stated to Ainsworth that there could be one that was not for every murder that was reported. Bundy said, add one digit to that, and you'll get it, in response to FBI agent's suggestion of a total count of 36. Although Keppel stated that Ted and I both knew the amount was significantly greater, he later admitted to Nelson that the standard estimate of 35 was true. Keppel doubts even he was aware of how many people he killed or the motives for their deaths.